Hi, I'm Carla Jones, Senior Director of Federalism and International Relations at ALEC, and I'd like to introduce Utah State Representative Ken Ivory. Representative Ivory was first elected to the Utah House of Representatives in 2010 and is also an adjunct professor in federalism at Utah Valley University. He's a national expert on state sovereignty. He's also author of Where's the Line? How States Protect the Constitution and continues to chair Alex Center to Restore the Balance of Government and to be a member of the Federalism and International Relations Task Force Executive Committee. Alec honored him as the National State Legislator of the Year in 2014, and he's also received Alec State Lawmaker of the Month Award. Representative Ivory and his wife, Becky, are the parents of four children and grandparents of several grandchildren, all very adorable. Welcome, Representative Ivory. Thanks, Carla. That grandchild is the most important part. Three of them and two of them are coming in from Texas tomorrow, so we're thrilled. That's wonderful. Well, you told me about the Federalism Tracker last month, and to me, honestly, it seems like a game changer. This is the yeah, kind of tool that... Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, it's just that this is the kind of tool that's going to give state lawmakers the ability to search on laws, regulations presidential executive orders, judicial decisions that have the potential to erode federalism. Now, as somebody who has tasked way too many interns in trying to track this kind of data, I can tell you having it all in one place is powerful. Can you describe the tracker and tell us what it can do? Yeah, Carla, I mean, you, you kind of hit some of the issues on the head that we're trying to deal with. So when you think about our system, uh, even Alexander Hamilton, right? He's, he was supposedly the big government guy of his day. And, and when he came out of the New York ratifying convention, he said that the balance between these two governments, state and national, is of the utmost importance. And we need to pay particular attention to that balance in the roles and responsibilities because it provides a double security to the rights of the people. And so what we were looking for is how do we track that? How do we track the actions of the federal government that, that overreach or intrude upon the roles and responsibilities of the states and to track that in a way that we can take meaningful action and, and work in a very systematic fashion instead of just waiting until someone gets upset enough to do something about a particular action. We want to be able to track this whole notion of, of jurisdiction and balance because those that formed our system said that the balance was crucial. So that's really where this came from, was how do we systematically, non-politically, look at the balance between the roles and responsibilities that the federal government is supposed to be engaging in versus the things that it's, it's trying to do and maintaining that jurisdiction where people's voice is more amplified at the state level. And who came up with the idea for the tracker? Well, as you know, we've been working on these issues for quite a long time. We, we started with a, uh, a federalism curriculum that's, that's uh, on the site at the Utah Valley University Center for Constitutional Studies. And we had scholars across the political spectrum teaching about the basics and the fundamentals of federalism. And then that led to a federalism index that if, if federalism is about balance in the, in the roles and responsibilities, we ought to be able to measure balance. And so also at the Center for Constitutional Studies, there's a federalism index that describes how is the balance of power between the state and national government? Is it good and getting better? Is it bad and getting worse? And we have a number of metrics that, that, that trend and, and show that picture. Well, then the next step was how do we systematically do this thing called federalism? That we know that this is central to our liberty, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly. And so that's that's really where this tracker came from. If, if you'd like, I'd, let's we can kind of jump in and and show you some of the uh, the operations of the tracker. Let's just hop in and we'll show you some of the cool things that we did. We just unveiled this uh, last Monday or actually this Monday uh, in our federalism committee. So what you're seeing is really the beta version of this federalism yeah. policy tracker. And you'll see here the federalism index and the continuing legal education on federalism and there's a whole number of other things on the analysis at the Utah Valley University Center for Constitutional Studies. But then here's where we jump into the, uh, the policy tracker. So we track 
in a non-political way all actions of the federal government. So we can look at them all. We can break them down by executive branch, by Congress, by courts. And so we're looking at all actions that objectively have some implication to federalism. And that's a term of art that the federal government has used. So we could we could look at just actions by the executive branch, by Congress. For us, what we do is we'll get this list and we break it down by our, our standing committees. And so most states have a business and labor or an economic development, education, government operations, judiciary and whatnot. So we can filter these federal actions, for example, by education. And we can look at the various federal actions that are that, that have federalism implications on education, for example. We could come back and look at just the executive uh, actions that have implications related to education. And uh, I think I stepped out. So for, if I were to go back to education then, so we can look at executive actions that have implications with respect to education and start looking and focusing on those. So then what we'll do at the state level, we review this nonpartisan uh, list and then we'll distribute those out to the various standing committees to look at the type of action that we'll do. And then very significantly, there's also a state policy tracker. So then we track all state actions to restore this balance of federalism, to maintain this balance. And what are states doing across the political spectrum to, to restore the type of jurisdiction that we have at the state. So Carla, you know, I like to look at it that in the states, we, our system was built upon having this rich diversity of states and having, you know, we have different experience, different culture, different religion, different e economies in various states. And the idea of federalism was to preserve that rich diversity and yet still be one as a nation for the big things that matter nationally, world peace and sound monetary system and mm -hmm. interstate highway system, those kinds of things. And so the idea here is to track this, to be able to restore that balance and preserve that rich diversity while still uniting for those things that we stand for as a nation. And uh, this was our way of looking at this uh, in a very systematic way to take politics out of it, that we're always looking at the structure of our government. You make a great point that this is going to be universally useful to just about every state. Is it available to every state? And also a, a little bit of a follow-up question in terms of tracking what states are doing to protect their own sovereignty. Are there states that are doing a little more than others? You know, where this is still the beta on this, we're still gathering the information. So we're looking for partners that are tracking federal action, state action, and we would love to connect to any other database, any other data that's out there so we can get more feeds in, kind of like the RSS feeds feeding into the database. But but we're gonna, we're gonna see that play out, right? As we begin to track and start loading the data in, uh, we'll begin to see which states are, are, are doing more and you know, federalism is a really interesting thing. What we saw during the Trump administration, we saw a lot of blue states looking at actions on uh, environment, marijuana, a, a number of things where the, the blue, the bluer states were taking a variety of federalism actions. And then as we get a, a different administration, you see the, the, the what are considered red states taking different actions. But the real idea is in states, we we have an understanding of what our economic needs, our cultural needs, our environmental needs are in our state. And we, we build these beautiful sandcastles that, that represent the needs of our state. And then we get these federal tide coming in and washing them out with these one size, I like to say one size fails all policies that just wash out these beautiful sandcastles that we build uniquely in our states. And so the idea is to really build that seawall unitedly. So California can do the kinds of things that are unique to California. Utah can do the kinds of things unique to Utah. And yet we still unite over the things that matter to all of us. And that's really what was the founding of our nation that made this whole experiment great. Uh, let me show you, if I can, the uh, the legislation Absolutely. that enacted uh, the, the federalism policy tracker. It was HB 209 that we passed this year. And um, I'm assuming you're able to see that now. So 
on the federalism uh, amendments that we did here. So we provide here for the commission to work with uh, institution of higher education to monitor federal law for possible implications on the principles of federalism. So that's the non-political review that we get on a regular basis. They'll update that policy tracker that, that you can you can find at the Utah Valley University Center for Constitutional Studies. And if you look under the federalism index, you'll be able to get to the tracker. Well, then once the Federalism Commission receives this, uh, this list and then the updated list, uh, the Federalism Commission looks at these, uh, these uh, actions that have possible federalism implications and then recommends the appropriate action, which may include no action. But, but taking no action now becomes a decision because we're put on notice of the kinds of things that, that have federalism implications. It may include corresponding with relevant federal agencies, uh, coordinating on public education efforts, joining in multiple state coordination, outreach with uh, local government officials and agencies, outreach and coordination with our congressional delegation or with Congress as a whole, lobbying our own delegation or Congress, <clears throat> legal challenges uh, of federal actions, uh, enacting state law to defend or preserve that constitutional balance and jurisdiction, or, or other actions under the constitutional powers of the state. And then for Utah, this is going to be on the regular standing agenda for the Legislative Management Committee, committee the Bipartisan Legislative Management Committee. So on an ongoing regular basis, we're going to be reviewing actions of the federal government with federalism implications so that we're maintaining those roles and responsibilities that really are designed to protect the liberty of the people. First of all, I love the sandcastle metaphor. You wrote an article using that metaphor not too long ago that we'll link to in this video. A lot of Americans mistakenly associate federalism with conservative principles. However, I've always made the case that state sovereignty has no party affiliation. And you were part of an Article 5 Academy that Alec hosted featuring federalism leaders from across the ideological spectrum. Can you speak to federalism as a nonpartisan construct in a little more detail than you just did? And tell our listeners what Utah Valley University has done to ensure that their tracker remains a tool that state lawmakers on both sides of the aisle can use with confidence. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, it would be like saying that a bicycle is partisan, that a bicycle is Republican or Democrat. You know, you have a bicycle that has two, two wheels and, and you've got the front tire and the back tire. And if the front tire is bloated and about to explode and the back tire is flat and it's about to chew the rubber off the rim, and if all we talk about is who should ride the bike and if it should go more to the left or the right, and we ignore the maintenance of the bicycle itself, that, that's really where we are in our system. The founders, the framers designed a structure. Uh, the Supreme Court has said even recently that the fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty. Structure is not left or right. Structure is how we preserve the voice of the American people. And if we go down the road of saying that's partisan, uh, Jonathan Turley, uh, you know, a self-prescribed, uh, described progressive said, down that road lies danger. It's the structure that provides the checks and balances. And that's what federalism really is. Carla, I'll give you a, a simple example. I can teach you how to memorize the entire U.S. Constitution in the next 30 seconds, right? It's very simple. The entire U.S. Constitution breaks down to if government which government? I mean, really just four words. If government, which government? And so the, the very first question was, did the people delegate their sovereign power to any government? The United States of America is the only government in the history of the world that stands for the proposition that the people are sovereign. And so the first question is, did the people delegate any of their sovereign power? And on many things we didn't. Uh, what we believe, how we worship, speak, who we who we associate with, uh, defending ourselves. There's many things we didn't delegate to government. But if we did delegate to government, the critical question is which government? A government farther away that's less accountable, that's less transparent. It is more powerful, 
And, and we did delegate some things to a government farther away, like world peace and the sound monetary system. But the things we delegated to a government farther away, we wrote down very specifically and everything else we kept at a government closer to the people because that's where their voice really matters. At a government that's closer to them, they can engage directly with their representatives. They can go right up to Capitol Hill and work a policy directly through the process and change the policy in their state. And often by changing it in a state, they change the policy for the entire nation. So, so where decisions are made is what federalism is really about. It's not what the decisions are, but where the decisions should be made. And that's critical to maintaining and amplifying the voice of the people, which is what our structure of government was all about, that idea and notion of self-government. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? You know, I, I think in the, in the age that we're in, Carla, we're seeing now uh, repeated surveys and studies that 80, 85% of the people are not happy with government. They don't think government is working for them. They don't think it reflects um, how protecting their rights and securing their rights. They think that government is out to serve itself. Well, that largely is a fun function of structure. That, that's what the Supreme Court was getting at when they say the fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty. And when we destroy that, we put liberty at peril. And so this notion of focusing on where decisions should be made over what the decision should be is absolutely critical to maintaining the diversity in, in our rich and diverse United States and then preserving that unity. And if we don't get back to that structure, I fear this, this whiplash every four years that we go completely one direction and then everything is supposed to be a one size fits all. And then the next four years we go 180 degrees the other way. And, and this is not healthy for the liberty, the property, the pursuit of happiness, the, the, the life of people that our system was supposed to uh, preserve and protect. And so, Getting back to this structure, I believe, is one of the most important things that, that, that certainly state lawmakers should be looking at. John Dickinson made the statement. He said, it will be their own faults if the several states allow the federal government to interfere in their jurisdiction. It's the state representatives and the state legislatures and the states that are designed to be the check and restore that balance, which is so critical to the voice of the people. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, for your leadership, both at ALEC and nationally, and for getting the word out about this tracker and what you've done to help put together this tracker. And yes. we look forward to an update on the tracker in the coming months. Yes. I want to see how state lawmakers are using it. It's innovative and it's powerful. Yeah, Carla, like we said, this is really the beta version. And so we're excited to get input. Please reach out to me. Let me know if there are things there that uh, that we can improve, other inputs that we can add into it. We're really hoping this becomes a tool that we can collaborate with other states and, and, and it becomes a tool for uh, many, all that are interested in this in this idea of structure. So please reach out to me. I'm sure Carly will put contact information uh, on this. And uh, we do look to make this a tool that we can all then collaborate because, you know, this whole idea of liberty and maintaining structure, it really is a team sport. And Carla, thank you for all of the, the work that you do. You keep uh, so many of these things moving and going and, and giving us uh, this forum and very grateful for, uh, for all you do to keep this discussion uh, going and moving uh, throughout the United States. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm fortunate to have members like you on the task force.